To assert an independent, objective position on the budget in the midst of the current mood of the Congress regarding fiscal matters is quite an accomplishment. The club has asked Dr. Penner to address the issue of the nation's budget deficit and its impact on Oregon. Is the deficit as serious and important as people have made it out to be? Is Graham Rudman the approach we should take? The current fiscal year deficit is about $210 billion. Graham Rudman is targeted to get it down to $147 billion. The Congressional Budget Office has issued some optimistic economic projections. Are those projections realistic? Indeed, support does come from Martin Feldstein, who spoke in Portland last week. He stated, quote, the near-term outlook is good with falling interest rates, a sharp fall in the price in oil, and an economic growth rate twice as strong this year as last. But here in Oregon, we can't help but wonder if in fact we will share in the growth or whether we would be asked to cover additional expenditures through local taxing as a result, for example, of Graham Rudman cuts. On Monday, Russell Sadler commented on the report of the Legislature's Trade and Economic Development Committee. I quote, the report is losing ground, the growing gap between Oregon and national income. Quote, Oregonians per capita income has dropped from 100 above the national average in 1978 to 1,200 below in 1984. The decline on the Oregon, of the Oregon economy is attributable to a number of factors. First, the decline in demand for Oregon wood products Industry income has gone from 8.6 billion in 1977 to 5.1 in 82. Second, the electronics firms, which added 24,000 jobs in the late 70s, saw 7,000 of those jobs lost in 1984. Third, construction employment declined from 53,000 jobs in 1979 to 30,000 in 1984. And finally, Oregon has not benefited from the large buildup of the defense industry. Thus, you can understand, Mr. P Dr. Penner, why we are so very interested in hearing about the current economic projections. Before becoming director of the Congressional Budget Office, Dr. Penner was director of the Fiscal Policy Studies and resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute for Policy Research. He was formerly assistant director for economic policy at the Office of Management and Budget. He has also served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Affairs at the Department of Housing and Urban Affairs and a Senior Staff Economist at the Council of Economic Advisors. Before 1975, Dr. Penner was a Professor of Economics at the University of Rochester. He was born at Windsor, Ontario, Canada and has studied at the University of Toronto. His PhD in Economics is from John Hopkins University. He recently edited a compilation of articles on taxing the family published by the American Enterprise Institute. He has authored numerous pamphlets and articles on tax and spending, including in the newspapers, the New York Times, Washington Post, and the Los Angeles Times. Please welcome Dr. Rudy Penner. Thank you very much. I used to uh, begin my standard talk on the, on the budget deficit since about last August uh, with the line that the Congress has done a lot more about the deficit than is generally perceived. And in February, we, for the first time since I was at CBO, uh, issued uh, projections under current law of a deficit that declined as opposed to rising as had all of our other deficits. Uh, but this was greeted with such glee uh, by the media, and particularly various Eastern newspapers, that now I feel obliged to begin my standard talk with the line that the Congress has done less about the deficit than is generally perceived. <laughs> the, while uh, there is a decline in our uh, projections from a deficit of this year of about $210 billion, as was mentioned, uh, down to a little over $100 billion by 1991, um, I'm old enough to remember when $100 billion was considered to be a lot of money, and <laughs> I believe that uh, it is sufficiently uh, worrisome to still be very concerned about the deficit 
uh, and indeed to be concerned about its effects on things like interest rates, which are so vital uh, to the construction industry, which is in turn so vital uh, to this state. But I think it, it worth a little bit of time uh, to look on what uh, the good things are that the Congress has done over the last couple of years. Uh, because I think we have, we have seen uh, around the country a, a mood of, uh, of frustration uh, at what appears to be congressional action. And admittedly, they've done things slowly. Uh, they've done it one complicated uh, step after another. Uh, they've done it in a somewhat confused fashion, but it has, in fact, added up to a very a large change in the outlook. Indeed, since we first got into this difficulty in 1981, when this great divergence between our revenue path and our spending path uh, really emerged, although the seeds of that go, go back quite a bit earlier, um, we have, in this anti-tax society, had four tax increases of considerable magnitude. We had the so-called TEFRA tax increase, mainly a tax increase on business in 1982. We've had a substantial gasoline tax increase. We've had a big Social Security payroll tax increase related to the Social Security reforms of 83. And uh, in 1984, we had the so-called down payment on the deficit, which was very largely a tax increase, again, very largely on business. Um, and all of that has uh, added up to a great deal of money, indeed, uh, up to about uh, two percentage points of our gross national income. We've done a lot on the spending side as well, that category of the budget that we budgeteers call non-defense discretionary spending. That really means everything other than defense and other than entitlements like Social Security and Medicare. That uh, so-called discretionary part of the budget is now absorbing less of our incomes uh, than it did in the early 1960s. Uh, that part of the budget had grown like topsy in the whole period really uh, since World War II, and uh, uh, especially pushed onward by the Great Society programs, and now uh, it's coming down the other side. Within that group, uh, as was noted, or within that category, uh, one of the major changes uh, has afflicted the grants to state and local government. Those grants expanded rapidly after World War II, reached a peak in 1978. Ever since, those have been coming down as both a share of the total budget and a share of our uh, national income. And uh, while I don't usually like to forecast the actions of my 535 bosses, I think one of the safest bets in town is that that uh, element of the budget will continue to uh, come downward, at least relative to our incomes. Haven't done as well on the entitlement side, it has to be admitted. Uh, but even there, though spending on entitlements is growing, there have been a number of major reforms. I noted the 1983 Social Security reform, which I think from a political point of view was quite courageous. It taxed Social Security benefits for the first time, something that was deemed unthinkable politically only five years before. It um, also uh, not affecting current deficits very much, but it took the very important step of raising the retirement age, and that will go into effect uh, late this century. In Medicare, we have a whole new payment system uh, oversimplifying somewhat, we used to pay hospitals for uh, providing care essentially on a cost plus contracting basis. A terribly inefficient way of doing things from the point of view of an economist at least. We have changed that system now to what's called the prospect of payment system, uh, which specifies a certain charge for uh, treating different types of um, illnesses and encourages the uh, hospital to treat it most efficiently. I think it's too early to say how that will all work out, 
but for that and other reasons, we're seeing a uh, major slowdown in the rate of growth of Medicare expenditures compared at least to where we thought they'd be when we were making our projections a couple of years ago as uh, both the admissions to hospitals and the length of stay in hospitals uh, has shortened in a major way. Now, I don't want to uh, blame that all on the prospective payment system because that hasn't had that much time to work. But for whatever reason, uh, we're seeing a slowdown there. But the biggest change of all, and I'm really surprised how little note it, it's gotten, um, has been in the area of defense spending. It was said that this state does not rely much on defense spending. That's probably fortunate for you all because we have gone from what was our biggest military buildup in our peacetime history to outright declines in defense spending. The, uh, as recently as two years ago, in October of 1984, the Congress voted for a budget plan that involved defense increases at uh, over five and a half, uh, excuse me, over five percent per year in real terms, that is after adjusting for inflation. We went from there to a new plan in July of 85, which specified zero real increase in, in 1986, followed by two years of 3% increase. We went from there to uh, an appropriation, which unlike most appropriations, actually came in considerably under budget. And we went from there to the first stage of automatic cuts under the Graham-Rudman-Hollings approach, which has left the defense appropriations in 1986, 3 to 4% below where they were in 1985. So again, we climbed up one side of the mountain and we seem to be taking it down the other side of the mountain. But are things as good as they look? I said at the beginning that I don't think that we should feel very sanguine about a hundred billion dollar deficits. I should say something about the assumptions on which those, uh, those projections are made. Because, uh, because the uh, congressional policy toward defense has uh, changed so rapidly and unpredictably, uh, we felt at the Congressional Budget Office that, that uh, this year we would simply have to project defense at zero real growth, a decision that was uh, pretty controversial amongst our bosses. Uh, but we didn't know exactly uh, what else to do under the circumstances. We typically have projected the non-defense areas at either zero real growth or in the case of entitlements under the assumption that the law didn't change. But if you reflect on what that means, it means there's no room no room whatsoever for any new initiatives in either the defense area or in the non-defense area in our projections. And I'll get back to that point later because it's a very important point. Also, as was suggested, your view of the future budget deficits depends very much on your view of how the economy will unfold. We don't think our projections are uh, overly optimistic Essentially, the, for the rest of this decade, we assume a historically average uh, growth rate at uh, this time of the business cycle, which is about 3.3% uh, or so per year. Uh, but of course, the budget is very sensitive to any kind of economic accident. A small recession could easily put us into the area of $200 billion deficits again. With regard to the assumption that uh, there's no new policy initiatives, uh, obviously that makes us very vulnerable to any sort of international crisis which might put uh, defense on the uh, upward path again. In the non-defense areas, I think I perceive a number of problems evolving that are very worrisome. Now, there has been an enormous change in the mood in Washington in that 
In the old days, meaning the 1970s, if you saw a problem out there, there was the automatic assumption that the federal government should do something about it. That automatic assumption is not made in this more conservative era, and people actually debate if there's a problem, who should handle it? Should it be the feds? Should it be state and local government? Should it perhaps be private initiative through private charities? But that debate, of course, doesn't make the problem go away. And the problems are there, and uh, I think that the most important one uh, involves demography. The federal government um, has, of course, accepted the uh, responsibility of serving the needs of the aged uh, really since the 1930s. The, and the number of programs we've had in that area have, of course, expanded through time as we invented Social Security in the 1930s, invented disability insurance in the 50s, and Medicare, of course, in the 60s. So the federal budget has been very sensitive to the age composition of the economy because of this, this huge burden that we've taken on. But in recent years, we've had a new development. Not only has the proportion of our population that is over 65 continued to grow and grow, but the proportion of that population that's over 80 is now exploding at a rapid rate. That, in turn, leads to a very strong and growing demand for long-term care, especially of the nursing home variety that is not covered by Medicare. So what we see going on in the budget is a lot of the elderly either uh, divesting themselves of their assets early or spending all their money on nursing home care to the point where they're poor enough to uh, qualify for Medicaid, which does cover nursing home care. And as a result of that, we see Medicaid, a program invented mainly for the poor and for children, very, very rapidly becoming an elderly person's program. And uh, it was never, as I say, designed for that, and it's a very inefficient way of handling that particular problem. It has had effects at the other end of the age distribution as well because the Medicaid program decisions about it are made largely by states and um, very largely by state welfare uh, departments that off also have to uh, have to worry about aid to dependent children which is the other end of the demographic spectrum also very worrisome as our illegit Ill illegitimacy rates have soared in this country and as a result the number of single parent families has also soared. So you have in, this bu in the budget very directly what the um, Senator Moynihan has been drawing attention to uh, recently, this intense conflict between the needs of the elderly on the one hand and the needs of the children on the other. And so far, it's manifested itself. Yes. We need to pick you up a little better on okay. the radio. Good. Thank you. So far, this conflict has manifested itself uh, by severe stringency in uh, the Aid to the Dependent Children program, uh, where the uh, average benefits have been tumbling uh, in real terms. Well, this is just one example of the sort of pressures that I think we face in the federal budget. There are many others as well. And as I say, and I'd like to emphasize, it isn't essential that it is the federal government that deal with these problems. Uh, but I also say uh, they aren't going to go away themselves since they're so inherently grounded in the age structure and family structure uh, of our population. It is, of course, a concern over these things, worry about the resulting deficit uh, that has led to the frustration that we observe on Cap Cap Capitol Hill 
uh, the frustration with not being able to undertake new initiatives given the stringent budget situation, uh, the frustration uh, with the size of the deficit that remains even though uh, we have taken a lot of actions in different parts of the budget. So it is that frustration which has led to the passage of the Graham-Rudman uh, legislation, uh, which to me is a colossal act because I think uh, Graham-Rudman-Hollings represents the most radical change in our fiscal decision-making procedures that we've had, uh, really, I think, in the history of the Republic. As you probably all know, that legislation sets very specific targets for the deficit extending all the way to 1991 when the, when the budget is supposed to be balanced. It imposes no constraints on how we should meet those targets. The Congress can do anything it wants. It can cut Social Security, it can cut defense, it can raise taxes. But the new part of it is that it says if you don't do that, there is this terrible monster coming down the road called sequestration, which is going to cut every part of the budget proportionately. Now, proportionate across the board cuts are not something that would be chosen by any rational human being. Indeed, uh, in many instances, result in completely absurd situations. Uh, in other words, no one would choose to cut the marine band exactly the same amount as Star Wars. Uh, I don't know which way you'd come out on that, but uh, <laughs> uh, in any case, it would be a great accident if you cut them proportionately. Similarly, we're forced under the law to cut a lot of areas that actually make money for the federal government. So some of these across-the-board cuts that we're pushed into actually increase the deficit. But this is a mindless monster that is to be unleashed, uh, which takes, as I said, an equal bite out of everything. I said cut everything. Uh, I shouldn't have said that because Graham Redmond Hollings itself has a set of priorities inherently built into it. It uh, exempts half the budget, either because it's involved in Social Security, which the uh, cuts don't touch, uh, involved in prior contracts, which are difficult to cut without great expense, uh, involved with interest on the debt, or th with the uh, various transfer programs uh, to poor people. It also restricts the amount you can cut another quarter of the budget by what we call special rules. For example, it specifies that various health programs like Medicare can't be cut by more than 2%. So really it's a program that unleashes this monster but tells it to feed only on a quarter of the budget out there, which has the indirect effect of making the final outcome very, very uncertain. I have great sympathy for any of you who are dealing with the federal government these days, either as a recipient of grants or whatever, because we simply don't know what kind of rules might be in effect next October uh, when all of this really becomes uh, relevant. Just to give you an example of how Graham Rudman enhances uncertainty, it is totally dependent on, for its workings, on economic forecasts. Uh, given the ridicule with which uh, economic forecasts are held these days, uh, I found it amazing that uh, the Congress gave them so much power. We gave them a forecast in February. The chances of that forecast remaining unchanged till August is almost nil. Um, and suppose come August, we decided that we were 1% wrong with our outlay estimate. Well, in a trillion dollar budget, 1% these days is $10 billion. In the good old days, prior to Graham Rudman Hollings, I would have said that's a trivial error. That's uh, in the noise, not even static. 
But now, if they have to find 10 billion more dollars, the rules of the game say you take half of it out of defense, take half out of it out of non-defense. But as I've explained, that comes out only of a quarter of the budget. So that, that $5 billion, for example, you get out of non-defense is 4.5% of the base that you're working with. So what I called a trivial error could mean the difference between a 4.5% cut of everything and a 9% cut of everything. And that's a big political difference. If you're a manager of anything, you know that's a big management difference. 4.5% you can usually find. 9% uh, there's usually blood on the floor. Uh, and indeed, as I say, 1% error is trivia. Could be 2%, could be 3%. We've made that kind of error in the past. So when you put that together, the uncertainty of over budget policy with the uncertainty over tax policy, I like to say these days um, that in Washington, uncertainty is our most important product. Uh, <laughs> It makes it extraordinarily difficult, as I said before, uh, for the private sector to plan on anything to the extent uh, they deal uh, with the federal government. So with those encouraging words, let me stop and take your questions. We'll do up and down. We will set up the microphone in the center of the room. Please, uh, the uh, questions are to be posed only by City Club members. Please identify yourselves. First question from Charlie Alcock, board member. Dr. Penner, the uh, expansion or the recovery that we've seen in the national economy started in 1982. It is now almost four years old. How long is are these good times going to last? And what kind of events will bring it down? Well, needless to say, I wish I really knew the answer to that question. Um, we, uh, we in our economic forecast had it lasting through 1987 at least. We make no pretense at forecasting beyond that. Uh, the reason that we think it, it quite uh, rational to expect a longer than usual re recovery is that uh, compared to full employment, that trough in 1982 was uh, the deepest trough that uh, we've experienced since the uh, Great Depression. So in other words, there was plenty of room to recover, and in the traditional uh, theory of the business cycle, uh, one thing that uh, very typically brings it to an end, which we don't really see occurring, uh, even in the rest of this decade, is, um, is a tightening of labor markets and a raising of wages and a, a degeneration into inflation, which eventually puts you down the other side of the business cycle. <laughs> Uh, other things can bring it to an end uh, as well, any kind of exogenous shock of some sort emanating from the rest of the world. Uh, a bad policy mistake as well could bring it to an end, but uh, needless to say, we don't forecast that. Um, in terms of uh, exogenous shocks, however, uh, the one we've experienced most recently, the uh, fall in oil prices is, of course, a good thing. And uh, we, uh, we expect that to help uh, continue the recovery. Uh, I might use this opportunity to clarify one point, because we don't pretend to forecast beyond 87. It's pretty presumptuous to forecast that far. Um, we just kind of smooth out the economy, as I said, with a, a fairly average uh, growth rate. But uh, that's an average of uh, six other expansions since World War II, only one of which did not have a, um, a recession in it. So our projections of the budget do not necessarily mean there will be no recession out there. Uh, they do imply, however, if a recession occur, it'd be fairly mild and certainly less uh, severe than the 1982 uh, experience. 
Yes. Janet Smith, uh, City Club member. You mentioned the fact, uh, Dr. Penner, that no new initiatives can be considered because of the deficit. Uh, yet, obviously, there's some initiatives, so they require an allocation, could yield overall savings if they were enacted, such as you were talking about the nursing home problem and alternatives to nursing homes. So we get locked into higher spending patterns because of the budget. Uh, we can't consider the alternatives. Uh, is there some way to get around this catch-22 situation? Well, uh, I didn't mean, of course, we couldn't do it. I meant that our projections didn't allow for it. I mean, the Congress can obviously do anything it wants. Uh, but you do, uh, you have very eloquently stated a, uh, a serious problem with the way we do business. Uh, I think the implication of your question is that in a lot of areas, to save money, you've got to spend a little money first to reform the program one way or another. And it's very hard to make that kind of trade-off uh, when pressured by a deficit, when people want immediate action on that, uh, or even under Graham Rudman, really, where it is required uh, to get it down. So having those targets out there make it difficult to engage in the kind of policy that you're talking about. Now, I don't want to, on the, on the other hand, as we always say at CBO, um, I, uh, I do think it is very, very useful to have the disciplining effect on the other part of government uh, that, is, uh, that is imposed by those targets. So I do think that uh, looking at the, the big picture of the budget, they're, they're very useful, but they do often dissuade us uh, in those uh, situations uh, where, as I said, we could we could save money long run by spending money short run. Yes. A uh, friend named a member, uh, Dr. Penner, do you think it would be a good idea or possible to move to a capital budget rather than the budget we have now? And second question, uh, do you think it's possible that we might move the Social Security Trust Fund out of the current budget the way it used to be before, uh, I guess, the 60s? Well, um, the, in, in answering your first question, um, I have always thought that we should do a better job of, of uh, keeping track of our capital investment in government than we do, and a better job, too, of, of looking at the depreciation of the public capital stock, something uh, that we really have very little information about. I've always been concerned, however, of, uh, about uh, taking a capital budget concept and making it a formal part of our budget process in the sense that the Congress would actually have to vote an aggregate capital amount and an aggregate current amount, uh, simply because uh, our economist definitions of what's capital and what's operating uh, are pretty vague. And um, that kind of vagueness uh, can be easily politically manipulated to give very misleading signals, as we saw it was uh, in the 1970s and the crises in New York City and New York State and so on, where more and more operating expenditures were arbitrarily redefined to be capital expenditures. So I've always worried about making it a formal part of the process, um, but I really do think that, that we could do a better job of informally uh, collecting more data on it and understanding uh, it better. I'm Herb Crane, a member. Uh, granted that Graham Rudman's monster poses horribly ugly, impossible uh, <coughs> threats to the economy and to the various operations of government, but also granting that the deficit that we have is equally monstrous and horrible in its implications, doesn't it just make sense that Congress might, in its so-called wisdom, exercise the discipline necessary to make the cuts in advance that are desirable to avoid those undesirable cuts that Graham Redman is forcing them to make? I, uh, 
I didn't mean to imply otherwise. I just meant to describe <laughs> that monster as the thing that indeed is supposed to induce them to make those cuts. Now, it should be noted that, uh, that Graham Rudman contains within itself bad incentives as well, uh, given the nature of the way we do our budget business. Because if you favor a program, but you expect it to be cut through a rational process, you of course have to ask yourself, mightn't I do better in an irrational process? And indeed, if you expect your appropriation to be cut, uh, there is a huge incentive to uh, delay and delay, which as you know is very easy in Washington, um, to avoid what is fondly now called the double hit. You take as a good guy your rational cut, the other people are all bad guys, they don't take their cut. When the sequester hits, you get cut yet again. I frankly worried when uh, Graham Rudman Hollings was first passed that those bad cuts, uh, excuse me, those bad incentives might outweigh the good incentives. I think our experience thus far, and we're a long way from the end of the uh, road, uh, is that that has not been true. I, I think one very good sign is that we did, within uh, recent days, get a so-called reconciliation deficit cutting bill through, uh, which will lower the 87 deficit by about $6 billion. The president just signed it the last couple of days. I frankly worried whether we get that through because of, of these incentives. And it has, so far in the deliberations, been very useful to have that target there. Um, so I'm a little more hopeful than I was uh, that, that we'd get just the result that you're talking about. On the other hand, at this moment in time, the budget is in a state of impasse. Uh, Graham Rudman Hollings says that we're supposed to have a budget resolution passed by April 15th. Not a hope in the world that that will be done. Uh, so those are, the, those are the bad signs. By the way, I forgot to answer the second part of the question. Uh, about uh, capital budgeting, uh, Graham Rudman Hollings has taken Social Security out of the budget uh, for the purposes of procedure. Uh, we st it's still totaled in for the purposes of, of figuring the deficit, but uh, it is separated procedurally now from the rest of the budget. Yes. Dan Goldie, member. Um, Dr. Penner, yesterday, the U.S. Senate passed a resolution overwhelmingly, it's a sense of the Senate, um, directed at the President saying that unless an agreement could be reached with the President over the budget deficits, there will be no tax reform passed by the Senate this year. Uh, given the impasse between the Congress and the President, particularly over whether or not there'll be tax increases, which is in the Senate plan. I wonder if you feel independent enough to be able to give us your forecast as to how this is going to play out, and whether you think that uh, in those circumstances, given the sense of the Senate resolution, there might be some uh, re uh, uh, agreement reached between the Congress and the President on a budget deficit program so sequestration won't be necessary? Well, I think the easiest response to your question is that I don't feel independent enough to make that forecast. Uh, that's fortunate because I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the, um, it is clearly very, very hard to, uh, to undertake within the Congress to major, major initiatives uh, like budget, um, a, a substantial budget deficit reduction on the one hand and, and a tax reform on the other. And that's giving them an enormous amount of, of trouble. Forecasting how it all comes out is truly very, very difficult. I think just as a symptom of how difficult it is, you can read in the paper this morning 
about the reasons that some senators voted the way they did, and a number and senators voted for that resolution for diametrically opposed reasons. Some backers of the president voting against it because they wanted to keep tax reform aside because that might be the vehicle for tax increases that they imposed. Other senators voting for that resolution because they wanted to keep tax reform in reserve, as it were, in case they had to raise taxes. So whenever you got uh, people voting for legislation for uh, precisely opposite reasons, uh, you got big trouble when it comes to forecasting how it's all going to come out. <laughs> yes, the mic. Uh, Bill Wood, member of the City Club. Uh, would you care to comment on present activity on the constitutionality of certain aspects of Graham Rudman Hollings? Yeah, I can't comment on that because I'm uh, not personally involved. Though one of the lawyers argued that I was really a sheep in wolf's clothing, uh, the lower court ruled that that was not so, and I had nothing to do with it whatsoever. So, um, no, the state of the, well, I, I should also say that listening to constitutional uh, lawyers forecast the actions of the Supreme Court reminds me of economists forecasting <laughs> interest rates. Um, the, um, but uh, just to give you the state of the play as it exists right now, the lower court ruled the law unconstitutional, but on the narrowest of possible grounds. The way the law works, we make our report to the Comptroller General, who plays a key role in administering the cuts. The, and to be an administrator, according to our Constitution, he should be part of the uh, executive branch. The court ruled he wasn't because he could be fired by the Congress. And uh, that, in essence, gave them a veto over what he did. And by the Chatter decision, we know that legislative vetoes are supposed to be unconstitutional. Should the Supreme Court agree, both on the result and on the grounds, because they're so narrow, that can be fairly easily fixed, uh, in theory at least. In theory, the Congress could pass a law allowing the President to fire the Comptroller General. They're unlikely to do that uh, because they uh, like to have control over him. Uh, other options have been suggested, a presidential commission that would administer the law. Uh, but uh, while uh, many uh, think the Supreme Court will agree, uh, many don't, by the way, but many think they will agree, but on totally different grounds, on the grounds that the law conveys too much budget power from the uh, legislative to the executive branch, an issue that the lower court really did not, sort of went out of its way not to decide, that would be harder to fix uh, if that was the result. But from our point of view at the Congressional Budget Office, uh, the mechanics of the law would remain exactly the same because uh, under those circumstances the law provides that we make our report to the Congress itself. It has to go to the floor unchanged. It can there meet other alternative plans. Um, but then the Congress would vote to put it into law, uh, something that is most surely constitutional. That, of course, could be vetoed by the President. So the uh, political dynamics change radically in terms of the incentives created for everybody by the law, but uh, from our point of view, the mechanics of how it operates uh, remains just the same. And I think it would, uh, some, some people think the Congress would just sort of drop it at that point. Um, I don't think that's a good assumption because I think it exists and it will impose enormous political pressures on them. Yes. Gail Johnson, City Club member. I would like you to address um, the impact on the budget of what some have called unduly large veterans' retirement benefits. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure in what regard you mean to uh, comment on it. They exist. Uh, we are entering the uh, stage of history now 
where the World War II veterans are starting to uh, retire, um, that will impose a huge burden on uh, not so much the retirement benefits, uh, but on the uh, veteran health care uh, element of the budget. Uh, but we do think that we have that uh, in our projections as accurately as we can, uh, we can make them. But it is going to be a hugely increasing cost as that big cohort of World War II veterans gets into that age group where uh, health care becomes more and more expensive. Uh, John O'Brien, uh, member. Um, uh, I'm thinking in about the efforts uh, to improve the budget building process. Obviously, that's what's, what's intended here. Uh, the Graham uh, Rugman Hollings bill suggests, in effect, that if managers or politicians who back particular programs don't build a good, responsible budget, they will all suffer pain. Um, in the world of, of organizations that I'm familiar with, it's known that it's usually better to provide some positive incentive for good performance. I wondered whether or not any thought has been given um, to uh, other ways to enhance the budgeting process that would provide incentives for those involved to promote some kind of collectively rational process. Um, well, I don't know if serious thought. It's sometimes uh, said that our wages should depend on it, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> congressmen and senators shouldn't get any raises until they uh, pass a balanced budget, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but those thoughts don't tend to get very far. <laughs> Gilbert Lamb, member. Dr. Penner, when the news media make references to reductions in Social Security, isn't what is really meant reductions in the proposed increases of Social Security? Uh, that's absolutely right, usually. I mean, you could think of absolute reductions, but usually uh, the controversy uh, in, in recent years, uh, those kinds of proposals have usually involved the COLA one way or another. Um, and the COLA, of course, is something that raises, uh, raises uh, Social Security benefits with inflation. Uh, if you don't give the COLA, uh, the only way you can think of it being cut is in real purchasing power terms. And in that sense, uh, we are talking about real cuts. Uh, but. Uh, about achieving them by reducing the, the rate of increase and in the money value of the, uh, of the benefit. I'm Joe Casco, member of the club. Uh, I, I'm not sure I can comprehend $200 billion. It's uh, a little more than I have in my pocket right now. But if, if one divides the total population of this country by $200 billion, I think it comes out of roughly $1,000 per capita or a family of four, like $4,000 per year. In my uh, limited uh, mental capacity, is that uh, possible to say that, that our f each family is receiving benefits from someplace of $4,000 more than they're earning, and every year they're getting an IOU for 4000 bucks that's coming due one of these days? I think that's a very good way to put it. I uh, can't think of a better way. I mean. I've sometimes characterized it differently, um, that uh, essentially uh, the revenues are now running about 80% of outlays, uh, that as we perceive the benefits we get from government, we're sort of getting a 20% discount. And uh, given the price, uh, perhaps that's why we want so much of it. But, uh, of course, uh, it's not a 20% discount forever, uh, just as you, uh, you suggest. Uh, there are those IOUs going out there uh, which are going to burden our children and grandchildren and so on. Deputy Director Member, uh, in your talk you referred to the reduction of oil prices being a very significant impact on our, to the benefit of our economy. Would you care to comment on the Vice President's recent trip to Saudi Arabia for the perceived purpose of stabilizing oil prices, if not to strengthen them? Well, there's been some controversy over the exact, uh, uh, whether that in fact is the purpose. Uh, 
there is, you know, unfortunately in economics, uh, there truly is no free lunch. And while I do strongly believe that uh, the fall in the price of oil is good for the American economy, uh, it has also been very disruptive in uh, various parts of the, uh, of the country. And uh, we have passed the point, obviously, where uh, we're beginning to shut down not an overwhelmingly significant amount of American production, but a lot of American production. That is to say, you hear res uh, reports all over the, from all over the country uh, that certain injection wells are being shut down, that uh, so-called stripper wells, if there's any repair needed on the equipment, they're being shut down, and so on. And one can't help but be somewhat disturbed by this, because if I understand the technology of how the whole thing works, once you shut those things down, they're finished. You can't start them up again, uh, except at enormous expense. So uh, the price, all I'm saying is that the price has fallen uh, so much uh, that, uh, that we do have this downside problem, and I think that's... Uh, to the extent all that stuff is true, um, well, there, there are more people than the vice president, obviously, who, um, who see some advantages to making the whole process go more slowly and less disruptively. Um, so, but again, I, you know, that doesn't change the basic conclusion that I really do think it a good thing, net-net, for the economy. I think we have two last questions. Go ahead. I'm Bob Shoemaker, member of the club. Uh, occasionally we hear from what we might call deficit debunkers who say that there's just a lot of hysteria out there about this deficit and when the economy turns around it will all disappear within a matter of one or two years and we really don't need to be as concerned about it as we are. Um, I'm not inclined to take that talk seriously but I would very much be interested in your comments on it. Well, there are different levels at which you, res you can respond. First of all, the recovery we've had from the recession of 1982 has uh, been one of the most average recoveries one can imagine. And with that average recovery, uh, the deficit thus far, of course, uh, has not only not gone away, but uh, has gotten bigger on, on a trend anyway. Uh, so you would need... Uh, had the Congress not done anything along the lines that I described, um, you would have needed an economic growth rate that is far beyond historical experience to solve the problem all by itself. But the Congress has done a lot of things, as I said, uh, to the point almost where you can actually make up fairly plausible scenarios uh, where it would go away. They'd take above average rates of growth, but it's, it's not outside the, the realm of possibility as it was a couple of years ago. On the other hand, I can make up equally plausible uh, scenarios uh, that would cause the deficit to soar to the $200, $250 billion level. Um, and uh, so I think that planning your budget, I'm sure none of you businessmen that do this, where you assume that uh, your experience is going to be significantly better than it ever has been in the past, or than, than your average experience, excuse me, uh, is not a good way to plan budgets. So, so you, don't, uh, you don't rely on that. Moreover, um, you can really paint some disaster scenarios uh, if, if we don't have a margin of error there. Uh, it is possible for the deficit to get so high that just the amount of debt you add every year increases your interest bill at such a rate that it becomes, after a period of time of compounding, becomes implausible to think of either raising taxes or cutting other spending uh, sufficiently to counter that. Now, when your business or is you as an individual get into that state of affairs, you generally declare bankruptcy. Countries don't declare bankruptcy because countries have an advantage that's not available to you and I, and that is a monopoly over the printing of money. And uh, that's exactly the way countries have gone when faced with that situation through history. Uh, you can't 
tax anymore, can't cut spending anymore, can't borrow anymore, your interest bill is so, so large, but it is pretty easy to rev up the printing presses. And at that point, you're not talking small amounts of inflation anymore. You're talking Bolivia, 30,000% per year, 40,000% per year. You're, the, the, uh, you're talking Israel, up to 1,000% per year inflation. So, uh, from my point of view, I want, <laughs> I want some margin of safety. I mean, here we sit with an economy that really is basically pretty prosperous. With an international situation, though always threatening, at least uh, in one of its calmer states, um, there is simply no excuse at this point for having a big deficit. And uh, so you don't, in my judgment, uh, you don't have the margin of safety from that sort of horror show I just described. And, uh, you know, raising the other question over here, you don't uh, really have any excuse for leaving all of those um, IOUs to uh, our children and grandchildren. Um, so, um, you can tell, I think it'd be a terrible mistake just to sit back and hope that through some, uh, some aberrant event that it would disappear. I don't rule out that probability. But to plan our life on that basis would be very foolish indeed. Yes, I think you wanted to ask the last question, Gus. Um, this has been, this, I'm Gus Matisdorf, a member. Uh, this has been the administration that has stood most firmly in favor of deregulating business. Uh, and yet, when the chips are down every once in a while, you see that uh, some people would really rather re-regulate business. Uh, the suggestion of the vice presidents was one. Uh, we hear, we read that perhaps exchange rates ought to be stabilized with the, for the offices of the Federal Reserve System. There are some people who would like to reduce imports through uh, tariffs and various other things like that. How does the, how do people in Washington reconcile these two conflicting aims? Well, uh, I think, uh, wasn't it Oscar Wilde who said that consistency is a product of a dull mind? Um, I, I think uh, only us economists uh, worry a lot about uh, being absolutely uh, consistent on these matters. Politicians are generally uh, much more pragmatic uh, animals. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, when, when particular uh, problems emerge and uh, create some uh, short-run pain, there is uh, always a very, very strong temptation to, uh, to interfere with the marketplace. And, uh, no administrations tend to be pure. Uh, there just may be a, a difference in frequency with which a free market uh, administration uh, interferes with the marketplace as opposed to one that's uh, more inter interventionist by uh, policy. Remember, uh, it was Richard Nixon who gave us uh, wage and price controls, the, uh, the most radical and comprehensive inf interference in the marketplace. And, uh, in decades after decades. Dr. Penner, we thank you for joining us today. And a reminder to you, our meeting is here next week, Dana Friedman. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>